Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Westendorf, and with me this morning is once again Pastor Pete Panitsky, and you are listening to Great Questions, Great Conversations, a podcast here that we host at St. Paul's in the Bridge in Muskego, Wisconsin. So we're grateful to have you uh, viewing in or listening in with us. Uh, Pastor Pete, how are you doing? I'm doing great. My voice is back. It's all healed up, so I'm I'm ready ready to go. And all of you guys listening on on like Spotify or Apple Music and whatnot, you cannot see the glow of his face after how many hours were you out at that graduation service? Three hours for graduation, <laughs> outdoor graduation. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about you, but it's like I can remember being in my teens and twenties. And it's like getting a tan was the thing like back in the nineties, before we knew about things like skin cancer, you know, we were, we were using that coconut oil SPF four, you know, cause it smelled good and you were going to get tanned slightly burnt and then you were going to look good. Right. And now it's funny. Cause we go outside and like, if I had white before it now just shows up, it's just hilarious. Now it's like, Hey, check out my tan. I am now esteemed. <laughs> The world has changed. <laughs> it is so different. But one of the things that we want to talk about that's not different are the means of grace. And so for those of you who are listening in, uh, we spent our last podcast uh, talking a lot about uh, specifically baptism, but we we got into talking about the means of grace. And, and Pastor Pete, I'd like us to start there. Um, you gave me a definition, gave us a definition that I love, the means of grace gives us the message of God's forgiveness. So once again, maybe take us through kind of those three forms of the means of grace that we talk about in the Lutheran church and uh, what are their ultimate meeting. And then we're going to jump into communion today. Great. So the, the key thought is that God has one promise of forgiveness and, and all the other promises that are connected to that, you know, eternal life and the comfort of knowing that our God is here and that he's working in us. And those promises come to us through God's word, whether we read it or listen to it or simply remember it, you know, that, that, that word of God conveys that message of God's love. God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit are saying to, to each one of us, I love you. But God also knows that we struggle sometimes to believe that's true of us. And so he has two visible words, two tangible ways to reassure us that that love, that promise of forgiveness applies to us personally. Uh, So baptism and the Lord's Supper. And I compare them to a hug. You know, I can tell uh, my wife, I love you. and she can tell me that too, but it's so much more powerful when when we give each other a hug, right? You know, and baptism, the Lord's Supper, they're not different promises from God. It's just a much more tangible, personal way to convey that message of love and forgiveness to us. And that's it's not a you must do this. Uh, it's I want this, just like I you know I want hugs from the the people that I love. You know, when they come up and give me a hug, it's not, oh, uh, I've had too many hugs this this week already. You know, it's like, no, (laughs) I need that reassurance of love. And the sacraments are the same thing. Um, Before we jump into communion, then maybe uh, this could take us on a little bit of a tangent, but I think it might be an important one, or at least for some people who are listening. I grew up thinking about the mathematics of things, like the if-then. And so we always talked about where does faith come from? Because in the Lutheran church, we do not believe that it comes of us. You know, the Bible has made it very clear. You were dead and there's no dead person who can give themselves the Heimlich maneuver or CPR or, you know, you're dead, you're dead. You need something to make you alive. And so I think when I was growing up and even into my adult life, and if I'm honest, into my 40s, I was more focused on, all right, faith comes from the means of grace. And therefore, this is how we uh, become alive. And this is how we grow in faith is we do, there it is, we do these things. This is the X's and O's of the Christian faith, be in God's word, because that's where faith comes from. And 
so I grew up thinking um, that again, if if you weren't baptized, um, that faith wasn't in you. And then I got older and I realized that God, you know, thief on the cross, God is working through his word. So it, it's the gospel, the communication of Jesus died for my sins. Um, and communion was always kind of this iffy one because it sounded like it was the kind of thing that you did after you came to faith. But then we talk about it strengthening faith and you need it for faith. And can you clear up maybe some of that confusion of where does faith come from and and how does this apply? How do how the sacraments in particular apply to faith once created? Right. So so it's really important to to understand that when we say that we're dead in our trespasses and sins, that that's the way we are before God creates the miracle of faith in our hearts. Mm-hmm. So we can't say yes to God on our own. But once the Holy Spirit has worked the miracle of faith in our hearts, then it's a daily choice. We are always choosing either to follow our Savior or to follow ourselves and, and ultimately Satan's temptations. So that there are, we have a will that must make daily choices. And sometimes I, I, I'm afraid that we as Lutherans, when we, we downplay the idea of choice, because we can't choose to believe in the first place, we lose sight of, now as a believer, I must daily be making choices to serve my Savior. Because if I love him, I will obey him. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So I I daily am called to make those choices. That's that's what my faith wants to do. So so how does does faith get created? It, It gets created through... God's word, God's promises. Uh, And, you know, we can humanly decide whether we want to listen to God's word or not, but we can't decide to believe. Just like, you know, the example in my mind is is, uh, late at night, I'm I'm worried about things, I can't get things out of my mind. And uh, if I could just make the decision, um, you know, God is in the heavens. He will do what he wants to do. I don't have to worry about it. I can go right to sleep. You know, and sometimes that happens. Yeah. But yeah. a lot of times I make that choice to believe, but I still worry. Yeah. You know, so so we can't make our hearts at rest with God. That's a miracle the Holy Spirit creates in us. And then continues in us. And it's how God gives us his promises. Promises, whether in the the, the word, mm-hmm. uh, spoken, read, remembered, heard, or the sacraments. It's, it's the promises that reassure us and strengthen our faith. that And, and maybe recreates faith when faith is gone. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, so so it is important for us as Christians to use the means of grace, word and sacraments. But again, not because this is a requirement, but it's I have this marvelous relationship with my God, and I can never hear him say, I love you enough. And I like yeah, how you I, said I like how you said I just it. sent an email to I just sent an email to Joni, my wife. And at the end of it, I, I typed in love you. Mm-hmm. And she responds back, love you too. Right. We don't have to do that. Right. I just want to. Yeah. And, and the relationship and want, is better for it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's I, all about, I have a, this marvelous relationship with God. And this is, this is my connection with my God. And I like what, what you said. And, and that's what my faith wants to do. Yeah. My, my faith is desiring this I, and i and i i love what I, yeah i mean this is helpful so so for all of you who are listening in um we're, we're going to talk about communion and why should why should i go and be a part of this um why should i participate what's the benefit out of it and things of that nature but like you said that that's what my faith wants to do and to your point about uh i love you i love you i love you when a husband and wife 
when a father and son, a, a mother and daughter, when friends stop hugging and stop saying, I love you, it's fascinating to see how that relationship separates oftentimes. Um, I have, re- you know, I'm sure you do do this too. I mean, we all have relationships where I could not see that person for 10 years, but there's such a, there has always been such a strong relationship between us because we've loved each other and because we've said it, uh, that when we see each other in person, there is this love. And yet how much stronger would that relationship be if we hadn't gone 10 years in between the two? Right. So with that segue um, and that picture, thanks for that, Pete. I, this is just, <laughs> this is this is gold. Um, let's talk about communion and, um, w- you know, what it is, what we is, you know, I, I think we probably have to get into the, well, is it the body? Is it the blood? Is it the drink? Is it the, what, what are we talking about? So what is it? Um, but first and foremost, let's talk about why Jesus instituted it and why it matters for us today. And then we can talk about the mechanics of it. Right. So, so the, the key thought that helps me appreciate communion is, you know, he said, take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. But he mentions this is the blood of the new covenant. Mm. And in Exodus chapter 24, at Mount Sinai, Moses and Aaron and the leaders of God's people gather on Mount Sinai to have a meal with God, to seal the covenant that was made with the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And an animal was sacrificed, and the blood of that animal was sprinkled on the people Part of it was put on the altar, and part of it was sprinkled on the people. And Moses said, this is the blood of the covenant. As you feel that blood and see that blood splattered on you, it's an assurance. This covenant that's given to us here at Mount Sinai applies to me. Hmm. And then in Jeremiah 31, and this is just the, the most important section, I think, as we think about the Lord's Supper, the meaning of it for us. In Jeremiah 31, God promises that I'm going to make a new covenant, and it's not going to be like this old covenant that I made with you at Mount Sinai, because you broke my covenant over and over again, even though I was a husband to you. You know, Mm -hmm. that's the history of God's Old Testament, you know, right? It's over and over again that the Israelites failed God, which can give us hope because it's like, well, we fail God over and over again, too. And he, unbelievably, he is graciously forgives us. But we, they broke that, that two-sided agreement. If you obey me fully, you will be my treasured people. That's an if, if uh, covenant in Exodus, Exodus 19. If you obey me fully, you will be my treasured possession. In Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34, God says, I'm going to make a new covenant. And there are four key promises to that new covenant. The foundational promise is right at the end. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. In the Lord's Supper, in the blood of the new covenant that we receive in the sacrament, we have this personal assurance of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that promise is I will be your God and you will be my people. Oh. I take the sacrament to be reminded of my identity, that I am God's child. Even though I I just feel lousy about myself, God says, you're mine. You're so precious. You are mine. And when you're afraid, I'm your God. Not your God in the sense of, you know, this is my billfold and I control it. Right. It's, he is my God who will use his power and his love and his wisdom for my benefit. So, you, you know, I will be your God and you will be my people. Um, no longer, uh, how is it going? I, I will put my law on their hearts and write it on their minds. Oh, as I receive this blood of the new covenant, I have the promise that God's going to change the way I think. So that what God wants is what I want. 
And then not only does he change the way he, I think, but he empowers me. No longer will a person say, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And I don't know why none of the translations translate the word know the way I think it should be translated here. In, in Hosea, the word know very often is translated acknowledge. So show that you know by the way you act and the way you speak. So no longer will a, a person they say, acknowledge the Lord by the way you act, for we will all acknowledge him from the least of us to the greatest. You know, in other words, God's going to work so powerfully in us that people will see, wow, God is at work in this person. Your actions show that you know God. You acknowledge him as your Savior, God. Forgiveness, identity, a changed way of thinking, and, and empowered to live to God's glory. I want that promise all the time. So I take the Lord's Supper whenever I can get it. Say that again. I uh, Forgiveness. Identity. Identity. A changed way of thinking. And empowered to live to God. Yeah, just read Jeremiah 30. One verses 33 to 34. Just read that over and over again and, and make that your own. Wow. You think about that when you're coming up to the Lord's Supper. There's just so much there. Pete, why haven't I heard this? I'm 49. Why haven't I heard it said this way? Well, because you don't listen to my sermons. You're too busy <laughs> getting ready to time. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Zingo on Mike. Woo! Uh, woo! But... Uh, I mean, I, I've heard some of this. I, I've, I've, I've heard us talk about this before, but you know, and, and we talked last time too that some of this is revealed. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not like we came in. You know, this is the for for all of us who you know we were joking at the front. You know, whiter hair, tan, how much things have changed. But one of the beautiful things that happens is, um, wisdom is something that is it's it's like a slow cooker. It takes a long time. Uh, Tim, we're at, at this recording. Tim Keller is has just recently passed away. Right. And gone is now that voice of all of that that information and wisdom and connectedness. And yet he's always, you know, he's he's God has poured it into you. He is pouring it into me because a day will come when I will need to share with other people these things that I'm learning later in life that actually are really, really important and beautiful. Um, but I'm always amazed, Pete, just how long how how much new stuff I'm learning and why I didn't learn it earlier. Maybe it was just there all the time and I just wasn't paying attention or I couldn't process it because I didn't have any, a care or experience, but holy cow. Yeah. That's why, you know, I, I read the Bible every day and, and you know, read through the Bible once a year and uh, I'm always finding something new, new connections. It's like, Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and I couldn't, I couldn't do that. At the seminary, yeah, at the seminary, I was I was you know plugging through some of this stuff kind of for the first time, and a lot of this you just don't get the first time. So again, like like we said early on uh, before we started recording today, that yeah. don't re don't compare yourself. You know, I could compare myself with Tim Keller and never measure up. Amen. All I'm trying to do is, am I am I growing in my faith today? Am I am I in do I know more about my Savior's love for me today than I did yesterday? It's a good day. Yeah. And, and compare yourself with yourself and strive to grow as yourself because there's always going to be people, pastors, professors, uh, scholars who know so much more. That's okay. There's always more to learn. That's beautiful. All right, so uh, Jeremiah thirty-one. This this is beautiful. This is huge. Um, but I, I hope for those of you who are listening that this what we just talked about. But Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-three to thirty-four. There's four promises that come in the new covenant of which Jesus establishes in Monday Thursday. There's forgiveness. It's identity. It's a changed way of thinking, and it's an empowerment to live to God's glory. And so, now we started there. 
Um, take us back to Maundy Thursday yeah. and, the, and the impact of that sacrament, that way of Jesus saying, I love you. Um, here's the promise of forgiveness and all the promises that then flow because of forgiveness. Take us back to Maundy Thursday and connect it to the church. And, 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 and I think that in my catechism days and even the seminary, I think I spent a whole lot more time uh, thinking about the mechanics. Yeah than the benefit. Uh, but the mechanics are important because Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood. So he gave them bread and he said, this is my body. He didn't say this symbolizes my body. He said, this is my body. Uh, and he didn't take, he took the cup and, and, and it was wine. I mean, you got to remember, this is this is spring. Have you ever tried to keep grape juice unrefrigerated for a long time? It becomes wine. Not necessarily good wine, but it, it starts to ferment. Yeah. Th- this is wine, fruit of the vine. Um, and he said, this cup of wine is the new covenant in my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. Those are two different ways that he said it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and why is it important to recognize that his body and blood are there, not just symbolized? Because symbolism then requires me to do more. See, if, if Jesus, if his body and blood are there, not because of the strength of my faith or what I understand, but just because of his promise— then whether my faith is strong or weak, his body and blood are there. And I'm getting the benefit of it. The stronger my faith, the more I'll appreciate it, right? The more I'll, I'll get out of it. But the promise is there. It's not just a reminder. It is here. Take it and eat it. Take it and drink it. And in in, in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 10, Mm-hmm. Paul says, the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Is it not a, a joining together, a having in common with the body of Christ? Bread and body, united. Mm-hmm. Fellowship, is that, it's the Greek word fellowship. Uh, they, they, they're united. They, they, there is something in common there. And then the, the cup which we bless, is it not a participation, the fellowship, a sharing in the blood of Christ. So all four elements are present. And if we take the Lord's Supper without thinking about it, in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul says, you know, examine yourself, think about it, understand what you're receiving, because if you don't, you are receiving it to your soul's heart. Yeah, you I've are always sinning been... against the body and blood of the Lord. You're not sinning against Jesus. You know, he didn't say you're sinning against Jesus. He, he, Paul wrote, you're sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. You, you are treating something that is holy with contempt. You know, think about in the Old Testament. Uh, the, this, you know, uh, I just read where King David has is, is put the Ark of the Covenant on, the, on a, an ox cart. And, and there, he's trying to move it from somebody's house up to Jerusalem, right? and the oxen stumble, and, and a guy reaches out, Perez reaches out to steady the ark of God. And, you know, he defiled the ark of God by even touching it. And he was struck down dead just like that. Ours is God who says, don't defile my holy things. You see it in Nadab and Abihu, earlier in the Old Testament, on the day that they were ordained, they bring unauthorized fire into God's presence, and they're struck down dead. The day they're ordained. Yeah. Um, ours is a God who says, do not treat you know, as unholy my holy things. And so you are guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So this is a powerful call to repentance for people who just go, ah, it's no big deal. And if you're 
you know, I, and I want to talk to the, my, my brothers and sisters in Christ who are going, well, maybe I'm not prepared to receive the Lord's Supper. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm going to receive it to my harm because maybe I'm, I'm going to sin against the body and blood of the Lord. I haven't examined myself properly. Guess what? If you have that question in your mind, the law has done its work. Yeah. You've already examined your, uh, yourself and said, I'm wanting, you know, I'm, I'm missing something. And that's who God invites to come and, and receive his body and blood. It's, it's, it's only for sinners. Jesus didn't come for the righteous. He came for sinners. And is that what, what basically is happening when we come either unprepared because we are not taking the time to, in humility, examine ourselves? In other words, examine the reality and be in humility, say, uh, you are God and I am not. And there are evidences in my life of the spaces. And whether you know them or not, my heart knows them, my mind knows them, you know them. I come so that that's a, that's a proper, but if, if I don't take the time to do that and I just say, Hey, here's this religious thing that we do, uh, I'll jump in. So that's a problem. And then number two, um, not believing it, that communion is what it is. Is that the other space where we can kind of not be, not be well prepared? Cause that kind of gets into that faith thing of like, well, is the body there? Is the blood there? Is it body and blood? Is it just, well, you know, we, we, you know, we want to make sure that people understand what they're receiving. And and uh, I think I, I'm a little afraid sometimes that we, we put too much emphasis on this idea of examine yourself. You know, Paul says, examine yourself. Uh, but sometimes I'm, I'm afraid we, we, we make that too structured. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. oh, I can't because I didn't think about the Lord's Supper this morning before I came to church. Now, if that's your practice and that's what you want to follow, that's fine. But ultimately, our services are structured to prepare you for the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. But there's hardly ever a time when we have celebrate the Lord's Supper when, first of all, we don't humbly be come before God, examine ourselves and confess I'm a sinner in some kind of confession of sins. Mm -hmm. And God, through the pastor, announces your sins are forgiven. Why do we do that? Because that's just part of the way that we prepare ourselves to receive the Lord's Supper properly. So, mm -hmm. you know, don't 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 get, you know, too mechanical yeah. about the idea of have I examined myself? If I see that I'm a sinner and I want to receive these marvelous promises in the sacrament, you are worthy and prepared to receive the sacrament. You know, and then then the whole issue of you know we we in in our church body we practice close communion. What what does that mean? You know, close communion is is one thing. The one issue is I, I want to make sure that you understand the Lord's Supper, so that you receive it to your benefit. You know, every once in a while I'll see somebody coming forward that I go, you know, we, we don't in, in, we're a large enough church that I you know we don't you know lean over and say, hey, I don't know you. Um, but I, I wonder, just the way they're acting, I don't think they understand what they're doing, that mm -hmm. they're not receiving it to their benefit. So we want people to understand what they're receiving. But then we also recognize that taking the Lord's Supper is, is a very powerful confession that we are united in faith. The very next passage after, you know, in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 is the blood that we break, or the blood, bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And then verse 17 says, okay, not only is there this fellowship of bread and body and wine and blood, but there's also this fellowship, this uniting with us, with fellow Christians. For we all, part, you know, uh, are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So, so we are making a confession, and that's when we just go, you know, and, unless you know what we believe, you, you really want to sit down and let's do some Bible study, you know, and, and it depends on where a person is. You know, some person, some people might be coming from a, a, a faith background that's very close to us, and, and so, oh, there's a, just a few highlights that we need to share with you to make sure that you understand the confession you're making. 
Mm -hmm. You know, somebody may be coming from a background that uh, I don't know anything about the Christian faith. Well, let's do some more Bible study so that you really understand what is the confession you're making, because we don't want you to make a confession that you don't agree with, that you don't understand. And that's, so it's, I, it's not, I'm not judging somebody's faith. All I'm saying is, you know, let's make sure that we're, we're all on, on the same page. That has been over the years, um, far more helpful because I would see these things, you know, we talk about fellowship or the participation or the confession as, um, exclusive, like we're excluding, but more and more, um, you see this as a, I, I want to make sure that you understand that when you participate with us, this is what you are saying. Are you aware of that? You know, for a lot of people, I think we've never even thought about that. Um, right. In fact, that's why we talk about it, you know, going to communion at a different uh, church that we know may not believe um, in what is happening or or the purpose of this, uh, of communion or the sacraments that we're not going to participate with you because there is a difference that we understand and we, we are not going to be able to, it's not that I don't love you in Christ. And it's not that we can't do life together and, 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 um, and, but there's a level of participation that I have to, I have to step back from. And likewise, I don't want to invite you into something that you don't know what you're participating in. Or that you disagree with, you know, or that I, you I disagree want, with. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to compel you to make a confession that you don't agree with. Yeah. So let's make sure that we're, let's just, just sit down and talk. And again, that talk can be relatively short or it can be many weeks long of a Bible, you know, of our membership Bible study. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of issues that, that sadly divide God's church. Just and, and, and we're not, and we're, again, we're not saying, Nobody else in the Christian faith is is saved. It's just when when you believe something is true and somebody says, no, that's not what I believe, you can't just ignore that and say, well, you can believe, you know, you, you, I'll accept what you, you teach and you accept what I teach, even though they conflict. Right. You, you know, uh, I'm not saying you're not a believer. It's just I just can't agree with what I think you're saying is wrong. Right. And that's where, you know, friends who are listening to that, this is probably one of the challenges. The sacraments are one of the spaces in which uh, we divide in part because we interpret God's word um, in, in different ways. Uh, I appreciate that we're trying to take, we, we talked, we've talked a little bit about this off and on with denominations and, and we've, we've tried to be transparent about what we believe and that there are different stances that you might be listening to or coming from. Um. But that these are these are differences that do have ramifications, and I think what you had said about that whole because this is the command that really carries when I was growing up a penalty, you know that there was a ooh hey you don't want to you don't want to miss this um, you need to pay attention. Um, it, it just became a little bit more serious for me to say, well, what does this mean? And I could take this and harm myself. A friend could take this and harm them. You know, I, I guess I need to look at this more seriously. And mm -hmm. so then this becomes a point of very good conversation, but the sacraments are a place in which the denominations divide. Right. Right. And I, I mean, it, it's helpful just to read through the, the first Corinthians and the backstory behind what Paul is saying. You know, the, the backstory is, Oh, I, I can I can celebrate at the idol temples and yeah. celebrate the Lord's Supper. And Paul's saying, you, you either are in fellowship with us or not. You know, you can't you can't be in fellowship with both. Right. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, somebody who's of a different Christian denomination is not worshiping at the idol temple. I'm not saying that, but I'm you know I can't ignore when I believe something that that church is teaching is wrong just to say, well, that's okay. Because I know that it has ramifications down the road. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, examine yourself. People were coming to the Lord's supper, you know, that they, they were, it was, the Corinthians were not a role model for how to do church. 
you know, they, they were coming and some were getting drunk at the, as they celebrated the Lord's Supper. And they were, you know, it wasn't potluck. It was, right. oh, bummer, that table over there's got nothing. And we've got this feast and let's celebrate, you know, and it was dividing the congregation and people were not thinking about what they were receiving. And it comes as no surprise that uh, the 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 fellowship meal that that the Corinthians enjoyed as part of celebrating the Lord's Supper didn't become a long term custom in God's church. Hmm. No, we're 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 going to focus our attention on Jesus' body and blood, and yeah. I mean that's the beauty of a sacramental church is that you are reminded over and over again of Jesus' death. This is what our ministry focus is all about. My Savior died for me and rose again. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And all the promises, I, I appreciate going all the way back to where we started with, that God has one promise of forgiveness, and it's out of that that all of the others, eternal life, blessings in this life, it's it's out of that that all of the other blessings flow. And so forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. And what is the central theme of God's word? God loves, God forgives. Even when we screw it up and go our own way and build our own kingdoms, God is still calling us because there's an eternal kingdom to the reality of humanity. And... Um, all of these other blessings and pour out of that, but he gave us the three means to do that, his word, and then these personal baptism. As a, and Listen to the last one if you're curious about baptism and just joining us for the first time, but uh, listen to that one. But baptism and communion, these personal touches of assurance that he does love me and does forgive my sin, and therefore his promises are good for me. That's so beautiful. Hmm. Um, this Whenever been... we receive the sacrament, uh, you know, it, it doesn't work just because we receive it. It's, it, you know, Luther said the words for you require nothing but a believing heart. Mm. You know, and that's, uh, this is given and shed for you. And, and so uh, faith grabs on to those promises. That's beautiful. And it's what my faith wants to do. Yeah. I love it. I had other questions, but man, I just think that this is too good a place to end. <laughs> All right. Um, this is awesome. Um, I think next week we've got, uh, for us, we're recording and it's going to be into Memorial Day. So we're probably going to take a week off. I'm going to supplement one from uh, Hannah Schirmerhorn. I had a good conversation with her. So I think we'll uh, kind of drop that one into the podcast Good. so that we can get a little bit of a break after the craziness of this week. Um, but uh, hey, this has been extremely helpful. I, I, we talked you and I years ago because we're going to be talking about family church because we want to get we want to get uh, some stuff in the podcast ahead of what we're going to be doing in September. But mm -hmm. we talked years ago that the picture of that I am the I have a family. I'm married. Um, my wife and I are, are kind of the co-pastors of our family church and that in, 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 a, in, a, in, I, in my opinion, in an idealized way, being part of a congregation is beautiful because I am serving alongside other pastoring people, but we have the opportunity to have trained pastors, the theologians like yourself, who are very much like when you were going to SEM, you had your profs, we have... Mm -hmm. Um, the gift that God has given you and Nate and you know our pastors that we work with um, has given you the opportunity to be almost professor to us. These are not things that I would have gone and sought out, but through a means like this, I just want to thank you for being a, a professor to me to help me be a better pastor. So yeah. this has been awesome. God be praised. If you guys uh, listening in or watching uh, have topics that you'd like us to consider, uh, we are always taking those. But I, again, I, I do hope that when you come to the Lord's Supper, that you will remember that fourfold promise that flows out of this, that you have forgiveness of sin in the new covenant, your identity, a changed way of thinking, and an empowered ability to live for the things of God uh, that other people might acknowledge that there's something Jesus about you. And I don't know what it is, but 
God gives us those gifts in the sacraments and specifically communion. So everybody, thanks for listening. Pastor Pete, thanks for being with us. And uh, we will see you guys all uh, next time that we go, probably in about two weeks. So God's blessings. This is great questions, great conversations. We'll see you next time.